For years, classrooms taught that Polynesians emerged from a tidy mix of Asians and Papuans. But ancient DNA from 3,000-year-old bones has just torched that myth. The first settlers carried almost pure East Asian ancestry, and the Papuan genes we see now arrived centuries later, often in ways that erased populations, but left languages standing. So if textbook history missed the most explosive chapter, what else have we got wrong about the real peopling of the Pacific? Ancient skeletons unearthed from the Lapita sites of Vanuatu and Tonga have been rewritten in the story of Pacific origins. When scientists extracted DNA from bones dating back 3,000 years, the results were plain. These first settlers carried almost exclusively East Asian-related ancestry. Their genetic signatures closely matched populations from ancient Taiwan and the northern Philippines, not New Guinea or the Bismarck Archipelago. Genome-wide analysis revealed that the earliest Lapita individuals, who navigated thousands of kilometers into the open Pacific, showed little to no Papuan ancestry. Geneticist Pontus Skoglund summarized the finding. The first remote Oceanians were not a blend of Asian and Papuan. They were almost entirely East Asian related. The Papuan ancestry came later. This finding stood in stark contrast to what many had assumed for decades. The Lapita expansion, long pictured as a blended wave of Asian and Papuan peoples, now appeared as a migration almost entirely driven by Austronesian-descended voyagers. In Vanuatu, Lapita period individuals dated between 3,100 and 2,500 years before present carried genetic profiles nearly indistinguishable from early Austronesians. The same held true for the oldest remains in Tonga. In both cases, ancient genomes showed a near total absence of Papuan markers. These unmixed lineages have vanished from the present-day Pacific, overwritten by later genetic arrivals. But their traces in ancient bones remain clear and unmistakable. The precision of the DNA evidence leaves little room for doubt. Genome percentages from Lapita era Vanuatu and Tonga approach 100% East Asian-related ancestry, with Papuan admixture levels so low they fall within statistical noise. Radiocarbon dates confirm the timing. These unmixed settlers reached remote Oceania between 3,100 and 2,300 years ago, centuries before Papuan ancestry appears in the region's genetic record. The Lapita people, famous for their stamped pottery and open ocean navigation, were not a hybrid population at all. They were the bearers of a singular genetic legacy, one that would soon be transformed. This discovery forced a fundamental rethink of how and when Papuan ancestry entered the Pacific. The initial wave of Lapita settlers built new societies on distant islands with almost purely Austronesian genes. The blended genetic profile found in modern Polynesians did not exist in this first generation. Instead, the story began with a bottleneck, a small group of East Asian-related voyagers carrying their culture, language, and DNA across the world's largest ocean. Only later would new migrations rewrite the genetic landscape, raising urgent questions about how these later arrivals reshaped the Pacific's peoples and identities. Inside the ancient DNA lab, the hunt for answers begins long before a genome sequence appears on a screen. Researchers work with some of the most unforgiving material in science, bone fragments buried for millennia in the humid soils of the Pacific. Not all bones are equal. The petrous portion of the temporal bone, nestled deep within the skull, is prized for its density and ability to shield DNA from decay. Compared to other skeletal parts, the petrous bone can yield up to 100 times more endogenous DNA, allowing scientists to recover genetic material even from remains over 3,000 years old. The process starts with gloves, masks, and full body suits. Every surface is wiped with bleach and UV light. Ancient DNA is fragile, easily overwhelmed by a stray skin cell or a breath from the technician. In these clean rooms, even a fingerprint can ruin an entire sample. Each bone is drilled or sanded 
to expose untouched inner tissue, then powdered and subjected to chemical extraction. The goal is to isolate only the original DNA, no modern contamination, no misleading signals. Authentication is relentless. Scientists look for characteristic damage patterns. Ancient DNA breaks apart in predictable ways, its ends often frayed or chemically altered. These molecular scars are a signature of authenticity. If a sample lacks the expected damage, or if the DNA sequence matches that of anyone in the lab, it is discarded. Only sequences with the right patterns and no sign of modern intrusion move forward. Next comes high throughput sequencing. Billions of DNA fragments are read, sorted, and cross-checked against global reference panels. The team runs controls alongside every ancient sample, blank extractions, negative PCR tests, and known modern genomes to catch any sign of cross-contamination. Each dataset is scrutinized for statistical outliers and batch effects that might hint at technical error. The payoff is precision. When the Lapita-era skeletons from Vanuatu and Tonga were analyzed, the overwhelming majority of DNA fragments matched East Asian-related populations, with Papuan markers entirely absent or present only at levels indistinguishable from background noise. The radiocarbon dates for these bones, confirmed by independent labs, lined up precisely with the earliest settlement of remote Oceania. These results did not just appear out of thin air. They survived the most demanding authentication protocols in the field. This rigorous approach gives weight to the findings. Ancient DNA, when handled with discipline and skepticism, can reveal population histories invisible to archaeology alone. The tools and standards developed in these labs now allow researchers to time genetic turnovers, trace the arrival of new ancestries, and reconstruct the peopling of the Pacific with a clarity that was impossible even a decade ago. Around 2,300 years ago, the genetic landscape of remote Oceania began to change. Ancient DNA from later burials in Vanuatu and Tonga shows a sharp increase in Papuan ancestry. Admixture dating methods, including linkage disequilibrium decay and radiocarbon analysis, confirm the timing. Where Lapita-era skeletons had almost exclusively East Asian-related DNA, individuals in the following centuries carried a substantial Papuan component, sometimes reaching 25 to 30 percent in Vanuatu and similar levels in Tonga. This was not gradual blending, but a distinct wave of new people arriving after the first settlers had already established themselves. The source of this new ancestry traces back to populations in the Bismarck Archipelago and the Western Solomons. Genetic models using F-statistics and admixture graphs fit best when they posit a later influx from these regions, rather than from the New Guinea highlands or more distant groups. In Santa Cruz, at the southeastern edge of the Solomons, Papuan-related ancestry reaches up to 90%, suggesting multiple waves or direct connections to specific near-Oceanian islands. These findings point to a more dynamic and multi-layered migration story than the old model of a single blended wave. Archaeological evidence aligns with the genetic timeline. The period of Papuan ancestry influx coincides with a major shift in material culture. The iconic Lapita dentate stamped pottery vanishes from Vanuatu and Tonga, replaced by planar ceramic styles. Obsidian sourcing also changes. Where once the majority came from the Bismarcks, new trade patterns emerge with a wider array of regional sources appearing in the archaeological record. These shifts suggest that the arrival of Papuan-related groups was not just genes, but also reconfigured trading networks and altered social landscapes. Settlement patterns reflect this upheaval. Archaeologists see a rise in denser villages and new inland sites during the same window that Papuan ancestry appears in the genomes. Isotopic studies of bones from this era reveal changes in diet with increased reliance on C4 plants or reef resources and higher rates of physiological stress. Osteological analyses show more skeletal foreignness, hinting at the arrival of people with different biology 
and possibly different ways of living. The evidence points to a demographic turnover that was both deep and widespread. Yet through all this, the Austronesian languages of the first settlers persisted. In places like Vanuatu, the genetic signature of the founding population was nearly erased, but their language survived. This raises questions about how new arrivals integrated or replaced existing communities. Genetic data alone cannot answer whether this process was peaceful, negotiated, or marked by conflict. What is clear is that the Papuan influx was not a footnote, but a transformative event that reshaped the ancestry of remote Oceania and set the stage for the complex societies that followed. Patterns hidden in the DNA of Pacific Islanders reveal a story shaped by more than simple mixing. Across the archipelagos, the genetic signatures left by ancient migrations do not blend smoothly. They form a patchwork, with each island carrying its own distinct balance of ancestries. One of the clearest signals comes from the difference between maternal and paternal lineages. Mitochondrial DNA, passed down from mothers, is overwhelmingly Asian derived on many islands. In contrast, the Y chromosome, inherited from fathers, often shows a much higher proportion of Melanesian or Papuan ancestry. This imbalance is not random. It reflects the social rules and realities of life in early oceanic societies. Austronesian-speaking pioneers, whose ancestors had sailed from Taiwan and the northern Philippines, often practiced matrilocal residence, where new husbands joined the wife's community rather than the other way around. When Papuan-related men arrived, sometimes through trade, sometimes through more forceful encounters, they tended to marry into these established communities. Over generations, the result was a population with Asian maternal lines and Papuan paternal lines, a genetic echo of social customs that played out across thousands of kilometers of open water. This sex-biased, one-off mixing pattern is not a single quirk. Studies of ancient and modern genomes from Vanuatu, Tonga, and the Solomons show the pattern repeating again and again. The Reich Lab and other research teams have found that even as islands shifted from nearly pure Austronesian ancestry to populations rich in Papuan genes, the maternal lineages remained stubbornly Asian. The Y chromosome, on the other hand, shifted toward Papuan sources. In some communities, more than 80% of mitochondrial DNA traces back to Asian ancestors, while the majority of Y chromosomes come from Melanesian men. The same pattern appears in the Munda of the Western Solomons, whose genomes are almost evenly split between Asian and Papuan ancestry, but whose maternal and paternal lines tell a different story. Voyaging played its part too. Each new island settled acted as a genetic bottleneck, with only a handful of people founding the next community. These founder effects amplified the quirks of the initial group so that one island might end up with mostly Asian maternal lines, while a neighboring island, settled by a different mix of people, showed a higher Papuan influence. Drift and chance could transform the genetic profile of a tiny population in just a few generations. The result is a mosaic, no single Polynesian genome, but a spectrum of ancestry proportions shaped by both migration and marriage patterns. These patchwork genomes explain why later signs of contact, like the arrival of Native American ancestry in Eastern Polynesia, stand out so clearly. Against the backdrop of centuries of asymmetric mixing and local founder effects, even small pulses of new DNA leave a visible mark. The story written in these genes is one of complexity, of societies shaped by both choice and circumstance, and of a Pacific past that defies any simple narrative. In 2020, a team led by Alexander Ioannidis ran a new kind of genetic analysis on more than 800 people from across the Pacific. They looked for segments of DNA that are identical by descent, long stretches inherited from a common ancestor, not just scattered markers. What they found startled even seasoned researchers. Clear traces of Native American ancestry were embedded in the genomes of Eastern Polynesians. The timing was no less surprising. 
By measuring the length and decay of these genetic segments, the team pinpointed the admixture event to around 1200 AD. This was centuries before Europeans reached the Pacific and before the first settlements on Rapa Nui. The segments matched most closely with indigenous populations from the Pacific coast of Colombia, not with other American groups. Ioannidis described the result as conclusive evidence that there was a single shared contact event between Polynesians and Native Americans. These findings mean that Polynesian voyagers either reached South America or met American travelers somewhere in the vastness of the Pacific. Their encounter left a genetic fingerprint that is still visible today. The presence of Native American DNA in multiple island groups all with the same contact date, expands the story of Pacific migration far beyond the old classroom maps. Suddenly, the genetic horizon stretches from Asia to the Americas, and the Pacific becomes a bridge, not a barrier. Sweet potato vines have tangled themselves into the heart of Pacific prehistory, fueling one of the region's most stubborn debates. Botanical genomics confirm the Polynesian sweet potato is closest to varieties from coastal South America, not any wild relatives from Asia or Oceania. Yet how it crossed the world's largest ocean remains unsettled. Some researchers point to natural drift, floating tubers carried by rare currents, arriving by chance on distant shores. Others highlight the uncanny match in names, Kumara in Polynesia echoes Quechua words from the Andes. Archaeological finds place sweet potato in the Cook Islands and the Marquesas at around 1000 AD to 1300 AD, with its spread into Rapa Nui only a century or two later. The timeline runs parallel to the Native American genetic signal in eastern Polynesia, but the mechanism, whether raft, canoe, or current, remains unresolved. In Vanuatu, the genetic story takes a darker turn. Ancient DNA reveals a near-total replacement of the original Austronesian-descended population by people with Papuan ancestry. Yet, the Austronesian language held on. Culture, it seems, can outlast the bodies that first carried it. This kind of demographic turnover, with language surviving population replacement, is rare and forces a reconsideration of how societies persist through upheaval. Old migration models are buckling under the evidence. The one-wave blended ancestry story cannot explain the sharp break between early Austronesian-rich Lapita genomes and the later Papuan influx. As David Reich said, the genetic replacement in Vanuatu was near total, but the languages remained Austronesian. The Pacific's past is not a single thread, but a tangled rope, one whose loose ends still provoke fierce debate. Today, genetic evidence forces us to confront that identity and ancestry rarely align as neatly as old maps or myths suggest. As DNA technology uncovers layers of migration, replacement, and contact, the Pacific story warns us, history is never as simple or as gentle as we wish. Every genome sequenced redraws the boundaries of who belongs. The past is unsettled, and so is the present. What do you think it means for today's Pacific?